Welcome to the To Love, Honor, and Vacuum podcast, the most awkward podcast on the internet where we like to talk about sex. Yes. Lots of sex. And I'm here with my daughter, which is what makes it awkward. Yep. <laughs> this is a very strange job. Yep. I'm Sheila Ray Gregoire from the To Love, Honor, and Vacuum blog, and we have just started doing these podcasts on YouTube as well. So if you are used to listening, that is wonderful. Tune in and listen. But if you want to watch us, you can also go to YouTube to our new channel and watch it there. And this month in July, we are doing a series called Sex Questions You Can't Ask Your Pastor. And it is to celebrate the launch of my new book, 31 Days to Great Sex, which I used to publish on my own. But uh, Zondervan has come out with a brand new edition. It's expanded. Uh, it's got new challenges in it. I changed some of them up, but I also added a whole lot of extra fun material, kind of like magazine-like like articles to make your sex life great. Uh, and that is for sale starting on the 14th, so you can pre-order it now. Uh, but also tonight, July 9th, we are doing our Sex Questions You Can't Ask Your Pastor event. So it is not too late to register for that if you are listening to this before 9 o'clock p.m. EST. On, <laughs> uh, July, on 9th. July 9th, 2020. Uh, but that event, it's $20. I'm going to get through as many sex questions as I can, so you can submit your questions when you register. And then you you are also going to get a free copy of 31 Days to Great Sex, a free download of our 24 Sexy Dares, which you can get as soon as you pay. And then later, I'm going to compile the 75 most commonly asked questions into an ebook, which I will send you called Sex Questions You Can't Ask Your Pastor. So for $20, you get all of that and you can register now. But for today's podcast, we have a whole bunch more sex questions. Yes, we do. Yes, and we do. We're calling this Sex Questions You Can't Ask Your Pastor. I think many pastors would probably chime in and say, these are more sex questions you shouldn't. <laughs> yes. I think a lot of people are asking these questions of their pastor. <laughs> and I don't even know how I ended up being the kind of uh, the kind of blog where people would send me these questions, but that's where we're at. You know what? And we're glad to be of service to these couples. Yes. You know? So here we go. A woman writes in and says, we've been married for several decades. He started using porn as a teenager and through our first decade of marriage when I found out. We went through a recovery program and I believe he hasn't used porn since. He is a wonderful husband and father, and I know he loves me. The issue is this. When we are intimate, sometimes I can tell when he's checked out and is imagining something different. The last time this happened, I said, are you somewhere else? His response was, yes, I was outside in the backyard with you. So basically, I pulled him back to reality with me in our bedroom, and then he couldn't orgasm. It makes me feel like I'm not enough. Even if he's not fantasizing about someone else, he's still not with me in the moment. I'm lying there naked with him having sex, and I still feel like he's not there. Am I wrong to be upset by this? This is a really actually quite difficult one because this this gets into a whole lot of things. So I'm going to try to dissect this in several pieces. Mm -hmm. The first one is when you grow up watching porn... <laughs> then what you're doing is you are pairing your sexual response and your sexual desire and arousal with external stimuli. So it's with something that you're, that you're watching or you're thinking about rather than something that um, you're feeling with another person. Or you're actively participating in. Exactly. So it becomes very much like a mental thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is true for women who read erotica as well. This isn't just a man thing. Or for women who watch porn, um, you know, it... it your sexual it's just a brain thing. It's a brain thing, yeah, because you're you're literally pairing your sexual response and arousal with external stimulation, um, other than a person. And even if he's he's quit the porn, that brain thing is still there. Yeah, and, and that does not mean that it can't change and we mm -hmm. can't retrain our brain. The brain mm -hmm. is incredibly good at learning and unlearning. Yeah. That's what your brain was made to do. Learn yeah. and unlearn. Yes. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it feels like it's better at the unlearning bit <laughs> in real life, but, you know, when yeah. it comes to this kind of, um, the, these kinds of issues of sex, mm -hmm. your brain can be retrained. Mm -hmm. um, and often we talk about the psychology of pornography in a way where it sounds like, well, if this has happened, oh, I'm just married to mm -hmm. a man with a porn addict's brain for the rest of my life. That does not need to be true. Right. But you do need to recognize that, it's, that it is happening. You both need to recognize that it's happening. And then you need to give both of you, whether it's her or him that's having this issue, you know, space to talk about when they're having it. But I also want to say, you know, our biggest sex organs are our brains. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is where it gets tricky because, you know... If you're making love and you're thinking about yourself on a beach, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not there with your spouse. Like, some people do like to think about 
being on a beach or memory remembering something wonderful that you did or whatever it might be um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not enjoying things with you um, and sometimes these thoughts just come into our head so I don't want to say like it's it, it, it certainly isn't a sin when you're when you're making love to imagine that you're on a beach or something it, it it, it might be wrong if you're imagining that there's other people there with you or that yeah. there's weird things going on. Like, it's but, okay if you try to distract yourself from, like, the coffee stain on the bedspread beside you and, you yes, know, the, the yes. paint job that you only mm-hmm. half did. And mm-hmm. Like, it's okay if you kind of are, are able to have a, a, a almost like a fantasy experience while you're with your spouse mm-hmm. that's about your spouse, that's that's honoring to your spouse. Yes. Um. And so it's not bad to necessarily. I, mm-hmm. I don't know what he meant with I was in the backyard with you. I am. I, um, I'm picturing like like that he just wanted to be under the stars on a blanket. I'm not picturing anything yeah. weird. But maybe it's like I'm a, like I want other people to watch us, and I like exhibitionism. And if it's that, then that's really <laughs> that's yeah. Really or bad, or so. like and and I, and maybe I'm just reading too much into it. But if if she discovered the porn use, like. Yeah. Maybe he's just trying to kind of thought of the first thing that he could say to kind of cover up yes, what was really and happening. That's, that's very true. Because what is he going to say? Oh no, I was picturing two women. Like yeah, what? No, that's very um, true as well. And so I, I would, I would be careful. Like mm-hmm. you know, if if this has been an issue for you in the past, you know, mm-hmm. um, learning how to be able to enjoy sex without having. To, to go fantasize. to the backyard or the beach yeah. is mm-hmm. is really important because mm-hmm. then you can learn how to do these things appropriately. Yeah. And a lot of that, too, comes by just training your body, which is really training your brain. But, you know, training, you know, working on letting your body feel arousal just by being touched. Mm-hmm. And, and that's actually easier when you deal with touch than when you deal with intercourse. Because with touch, it's much harder to fantasize. Because you're right, it's it's kind of funny, but it's easier for your brain to go when there's intercourse involved than than when you're just touching, because you tend to be talking more, moving more, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something which, again, um, 31 Days to Great Sex goes into a lot of exercises to help you do that, to, to retrain your brain, to help you focus on what's happening in the present, uh, to help figure out what arouses you. But when a lot of people have reached orgasm because of what's going on in their brain, um, because they're fantasizing about something else, then getting arousal and understanding how you can really get a lot of pleasure just from someone else touching you is is an important step and so i would say like start with that like just touch him for a while have him touch you for a while like really ramp up the foreplay and not just the intercourse yeah and if you do have a spouse who has checked out in the past you know or who has been very mentally not present or who's had a pornography addiction or Mm -hmm. erotica addiction or anything like that Mm -hmm. you know making it very clear that it is no longer acceptable to leave your spouse in your mind when you're having sex yeah also means that if that starts to happen sex needs to stop yes you know like you can you can decide that as a couple like hey I'm going to decide to not be offended if mm-hmm. you are honest and say, I'm, I'm don't mm-hmm. want to make this any stronger in my brain. We need to stop right now. Yeah. You can pick up later or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, because when we do things that reinforce what our brain yes. already knows how to do, yeah. it can make the problem worse. So if you're, if you're trying your best not to go to your fantasy place in your head, mm-hmm. but it just keeps happening, mm-hmm. like stop it. Yeah, and you know tell what's... your spouse. And that means that if you're the woman in this situation, you need to you need to be able to handle your husband telling you that. Now, I would also say that if your husband is constantly having this issue and is refusing to deal with it, mm-hmm. um, he can't just say, "Well, I'm just to have sex until I until I leave in my head, and then I'm just gonna say, okay, bye." Like mm-hmm. you, you can't live like that forever. That's not what we're saying, and yeah. it does hurt. When your husband is like, okay, I'm picturing someone else, and so we have to stop yeah, doing this. Yeah, and that's this. never okay. No, that's, and that's not okay, okay to say like this. Like, oh, man, I'm picturing a woman with bigger boobs than you. I guess yeah. we got to stop this again. Like, that's not, not appropriate. A, not okay. But if you're in the very beginning stages of, you know, recovering from a porn addiction or recovering from a sex addiction of any sort, mm-hmm. um, being able to say, like, I, I am no longer going to do things that are contributing to this problem may mean... That sometimes during sex you need to stop. Now, I would say if you're in a situation where this is happening, like, really, really frequently, maybe Mm -hmm. you just need to not have sex for a while. Yep. 
And like, and and I also want to say, you know, this is this is something that's okay to pray about. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit loves doing this stuff. He loves transforming you and taking something which has been ruined or which has been really distorted and making it pure again. And hot, passionate sex in marriage is very pure. Mm -hmm. That is what the Holy Spirit loves doing. And so, you know, pray before your encounter that, that the Holy Spirit will just help you be able to totally focus on each other, to get pleasure from each other. Um, and that, that's a good thing to do and that can help as well. Yeah. And I do also want to say though, like if you were the wife in this situation and your husband has this issue and, um, focusing on his issue is making sex horrible for you. Mm -hmm. You also don't need to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Um, if your husband decides like, you know, I, I am going to pray beforehand and stuff, you, you can decide. I, I can't think about the fact that you have a porn addiction five seconds before we start having sex. Yes. That's very true um, as well. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you as a spouse, so if you're, if your spouse is trying to work towards becoming more and more like Christ and living in the mm -hmm. spirit, you need to be part of the solution. Yes. You don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to be part of every single step of the solution. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so this is something where you can figure out what you're comfortable with. And we're not saying that everyone needs to do the exact same uh has mm -hmm. have the same level of comfortability mm -hmm. um and so these are things that are just going to require a lot of wisdom accountability partners are great um mm -hmm. you know talking through this with the understanding that it's going to be a nuanced conversation mm -hmm. is really important and also you know this guy watched porn it sounds like for at least 10 years if not more yeah um and you know sometimes that can really change. Like the reason that, that some people get addicted to pornography, that can actually change a lot of, um, it can spring from a lot of shame issues we have inside ourselves. It can cause a lot of shame issues. Um, it can, it can warp our sexual desire because, you know, if you're, if your basic need was acceptance and you were getting that from porn in a very distorted way, but that basic need for acceptance has never really been worked on. You know, this is the kind of thing where if you go to see a licensed counselor, some of those deeper issues, which actually contributed to the porn addiction in the first place, when those root issues are dealt with, then sometimes you can get rid of, or it's easier to put a lot of this other stuff behind you too. So yes. for some, for some people, um, that can be a big, a big thing. Okay. Question number two. She writes, my struggle with sex in my marriage is that 90% of the pleasure from it is cognitive in nature. By this, I mean what I'm thinking about, like fantasy, recalling things from romance novels or porn. As a woman, that is incredibly isolating. My husband is very generous in bed and is frustrated that I'm often not in the mood. We are both Christians and I'm often not in the mood because I'm trying to keep my mind pure. I just am not aroused by thinking of my husband in various scenarios, but I'm far more drawn to fantasy and fiction. He, in turn, wants to encourage me to read romance novels, imagine anything I want fantasy-wise, and even view porn together. I feel caught between my flesh and my spirit. Like my options are puritanical, boring, unfulfilled sex with a pure mind, or hot and dirty sex where my mind is engaged, but I feel awful when I go to church. I love my husband dearly, but it is a huge struggle because I just don't feel turned on unless there is something naughty or wrong about it. And thinking of my husband that way is not only not wrong, it's expected. Is it wrong to engage in some of these extracurricular activities if it makes sex better between the husband and wife, or is it just always wrong? And if it's always wrong, then what do you do when only thinking of your husband doesn't cut it for you and you have an overactive mind? Wow. Wow, great question. And I know she says that um, being a woman who is drawn to porn or erotica in the Christian world is very isolating, but I just want to stress that many, many women deal with this. It isn't just a male problem. And yeah. so she's not, she's definitely not alone. Um, I, I want to say too, before we start anything, watching porn together is not an option. No. And that's and what I wanted to talk about yeah, too. And, and I just want to get that over with before we deal with like fantasy and all that stuff. It's like, it, and, and it's not an option, not just because porn is morally wrong and you shouldn't be fantasizing about someone else, et cetera, et cetera. Porn does fuel sex trafficking. Yeah. And we have a whole post about it that my husband actually did a bunch of research yeah. for and he wrote a really good post. If you read it, mm -hmm. you'll want to take a shower afterwards, but it's necessary to understand this. Yeah. Um, and we'll be linking that in the podcast links here. Yeah. So porn is off the table. Absolutely no way, no how. Um, and and then I want to just deal with the fact that her husband is saying, I don't care how you get aroused as long as you get aroused and hot. So, you know, if that means reading romance novels, reading erotica, watching porn, I'm all great with that. Let's just go and have fun. The problem with that mindset, though, is that if the way that you're getting aroused is through erotica, porn, romance novels, movies, whatever it might be, 
and you're imagining that in your head, then what you're really doing is you're treating your husband like a sex toy. Yeah, and, and this this whole question comes down to a bigger bigger issue, which is what's mm-hmm. the goal of sex? Is it to yeah. have orgasms or yeah. is it to actually have intimacy and strengthen your marriage? Right, right. And so that's difficult. Now, at the same time, so with that being said, like let, let, I'm just going to be adamant that I don't think that erotica, et cetera, et cetera, are ever good for a marriage. Um, and erotica is very tricky because yeah. these things are on a spectrum, right? Like you don't yeah. immediately start with the throbbing member and <laughs> the graphic descriptions of taking his clothes off and yeah. all that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, like a lot of times, like there's, it goes from just basic romance novels and then it's a spectrum to erotica or mm-hmm. written. Por- erotica, when we talk about erotica, is written pornography. Right. We're yes. not talking romance novels. Um, yeah. We're talking or things even that are fantasy explicit. novels. Yeah. You know, like, because a lot of people uh, email us, they say, oh, I have a struggle with erotica, I like reading romance novels. And I'm like, well, well, okay, we can do something with some, mm-hmm. with a romance novel that's not inherently bad and use it in an unhealthy way, mm-hmm. but romance novels is not the same as erotica. Right. Um, and I think I want to make that really clear. Like, yeah. we're talking about the kind of Tumblr fan fiction <laughs> kind of situation here, or like the typical Harlequin novels where, like... Mm-hmm. everything is written, mm-hmm. um, or mm-hmm. Fifty Shades of Grey, that kind of thing. Yeah. So what I would say to this woman is, you know, if you're struggling with not finding your husband hot enough, I doubt in most cases it's that your husband isn't hot enough. I think it's that you've trained your brain to that fantasy is your go-to for sexual yeah. arousal, just like we talked about with the last question, and that needs to be untrained. And you need to learn to train instead to focus on relationship and encounters with your spouse. There are lots of examples in 31 Days to Great Sex on how to spice things up, playing the dice game, um, lots of things, his and her fantasy, like lots of things that can really be fun, but that are still relationship affirming and aren't and aren't gross and don't cross a line. And I think incorporating a lot more of those things can help with some of this too. Mm -hmm. But I do want to talk about the root of some fantasies because I think this is something that we don't always understand. Like when we, when, when people struggle with fantasy, there's often something that's the root of that. Like one thing that researchers have been looking at for ages is the fact that many, many women have rape fantasies. Yeah. And yet I don't know any woman who actually wants to be raped. Yeah. (laughs) Like it is the most traumatic thing that, you know, a woman can go through pretty much. And yeah, or yet, it's up there. <laughs> it's up there, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh-huh. And it has tremendously damaging, horrible, long-term consequences. And yet many women have fantasies that involve rape. And when we look at the root of that, if you're having to go in your mind to a certain or specific fantasy, often there's something going on internally. Like, mm-hmm. what they found with rape fantasies is that it's often a woman's desire to not have to be in control because she feels so... Like, she's so constrained in her life and that she has to be controlled at all times. And she actually lives quite a fearful life that the reason a rape fantasy appeals is because she's not in control. Yeah, (laughs) it's it's not actually that the woman wants to experience that. And often when women have those fantasies, they find them incredibly abhorrent themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so stressful is they don't understand, why am I thinking this? Like, this is horrible. Why am I having this intrusive thought? Yeah, yeah. um, And so, so... it, but it often has a reason why it comes up, right? The same reason, the same, um, mm-hmm. in a similar way, when we talked about, you know, men with porn addiction in the previous question, a lot of men become addicted yeah. to porn as a coping mechanism for intense stress. Yes. Like, there's often a reason behind the harmful behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and for fantasies, there's often a reason behind specific fantasies. And so mm-hmm. if you have something you have to go to in your head, you know, yeah. try it. Like, yeah. you could ask yourself, why yeah. is this coming to me again and again and again? What is... What is my, my psyche mm-hmm. trying to tell me? Like, what am, mm-hmm. what am I trying to tell myself kind of thing? Yeah, because it isn't only that you're drawn to erotica or that you used erotica or porn. Often it's that some of those stories or scenarios or whatever really trigger something in you. Like they, they meet a need that you don't even know mm-hmm. that you have mm-hmm. sometimes. And if you can look at that and you can figure, okay, that's actually the root, then maybe working on that root and helping me feel like it's okay to not be in control. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's okay to let go. Um, let's let's do that in different areas of the life, not of my life, not just in the bedroom. That can have uh, that can help a lot as well. But no, it isn't okay to go to porn or fantasy erotica. Um, all you're really doing then is you're you're dissociating from what's going on. You're separating in your head, and then you're using your spouse as a masturbatory tool. Yes, 
actually it's just not good. And even if he's okay mm-hmm. with it, mm-hmm. not it's good. still not good, right? Because a lot of guys are like, well, I don't care as long as I'm getting sex. Like, like, yeah. we, get, we honestly do get comments like that a lot. Yeah. But the thing is that not all men do feel like that. Mm-hmm. And we get a lot of comments mm-hmm. from men who know their wives check out. Yeah. You know, and it just kills yeah. them. Yeah. Or men who early in their marriage, they were fine with it when they were just kind of young and just, you know, would have just wanted to do whatever it took just to get yeah. as much sex as you could, right? But yeah. as you get older and you want a more matured relationship and yeah. you crave the intimacy more, it's just this gaping hole that at that point is, is going to mm-hmm. take years to undo because mm-hmm. it's been years in the making. Yeah. So if, if this is something that you're dealing with, you got to nip it in the bud and you got to start now. Yeah. Um, even if this has been happening for seven years, like yeah. don't let it be seven more years before yeah. you fix it. Exactly. And again, um, take a look at 31 days to great sex. I will say that it is a lot easier, um, to, to feel good, to feel aroused, uh, without all the fantasy. If you spend a lot more time on foreplay Yeah. and, and not just go straight for intercourse. And that's what a lot of these exercises do because it's a lot easier to be present in the moment when it's about touching and doing things and, and all of that sort of thing. So take a look at that and that can help. All right. Next question. Are you ready? This is seriously the most awkward mother daughter podcast in the world. All right. <laughs> oh, it's about to get worse. I just saw the title for the question. It's about to get worse. All right. Um, I've been married for my hu- to my husband uh, for just over a decade and a half. I was fairly young when we got married, and it took me a few years before my first orgasm. My husband struggles with premature ejaculation, but we seem to have found ways to work around it with delay sprays and condoms, which has definitely helped. However, my husband, given the choice, would always pick oral sex over intercourse. He compromises compromises with sex and says if we are being sexual together, then that is sex. He feels because he takes time with foreplay for me that he should get the same amount of time on foreplay for him. I didn't realize guys need foreplay as they always seem ready, lol. (laughs) I don't mind doing it occasionally if it makes him happy, but I just feel that it's not the same as intercourse or what God intended and I just don't feel the same connection. Are we both being selfish? Really not sure how to move forward from this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I do want to say one thing that the husband said I do think is true. You Mm -hmm. know, if you are being sexual together and you're working towards orgasm together, together, Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. is sex. Yes. Right? Because there are a lot of people because of health issues or, um, like, vaginismus issues maybe. Mm -hmm. Or, like, there's a lot of reasons why couples might not be able to engage in intercourse for a while. That does not mean you can't have a sex life. Right. Okay? Yes. So, like, sex is not just, you know the deed yes. it encompasses a wide range of behaviors and it's it's more but a holistic lifestyle of being sexual together and enjoying sexuality mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. okay so mm-hmm. let's just say that first yes. of all absolutely however <laughs> however <laughs> when your entire idea about sex is well there's this one thing where i just kind of get to lie back and take it Mm -hmm. and it's not a mutual experience even if he's given stuff to her too if it's always we have to take turns and we never do something together yeah or and and he's actively like doesn't enjoy doing things together that's what the red flag is like he has to compromise to Uh have sex with her yeah that's a problem yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and i will say probably what's going on here too is that he, because of the premature ejaculation, intercourse itself has become something stressful for him. Yeah, or something embarrassing, Embarrassing, right? yeah. He feels inadequate. Uh, and premature ejaculation um, is when a husband, usually, I think they, they classify it as within two to three minutes. Yeah, like you minutes. cannot you cannot, sustain you cannot an erection sustain for longer than two or three minutes without, without ejaculation. ejaculation. Um, and often it's much quicker than that. Yeah. And there are some there are some strategies that you can try. The stop and go technique. Uh, there's a squeeze technique. Mm-hmm. Uh, she talks about a delay spray. Not quite sure what that is. I should look that up. Yep. <laughs> Sounds a little bit eek. The things um, you have to Google for this job, I will say. Yes, don't Google most things, by the way. Just a nice <laughs> public Let health message. Let us Google it for you. <laughs> um, you know, and condoms, very thick condoms can help uh, reduce stimulation. Um, but I, I have a feeling that's also what's happening. And I would mm-hmm. just say, you know, don't give up on that. Keep working on the premature ejaculation. You, A lot of guys can uh, recover from that or they can at least they can at least manage to last longer um, you can also do things where earlier in the day you have a quickie <laughs> so, yes. and then and then later you go to intercourse and because he's had frequent or recent release he's able to last longer um, so there are different techniques that you can try and I would suggest that but I think I think a lot of this may be and this is common with erectile dysfunction as well is that guys 
do feel awkward. They do feel embarrassed. Yeah. And so they would prefer something else. Um, I, I think there's also, a, there's also a misunderstanding. Like, well, if, if she gets foreplay, then he should get foreplay. But the re and, and there is some truth to that. But the other thing is that the reason that she needs foreplay is because for the vast majority of women, it is easier to reach orgasm through stimulation other than intercourse. And if they are going to reach orgasm during intercourse, they usually need to be aroused significantly before intercourse starts. Mm -hmm. And so foreplay isn't optional for women. It's not like, well, I'm doing all of this for you. Like I'm doing you a favor <laughs> by, by making sure you're aroused this. before we have sex. Yeah. No, like this should be something which is intended, which is just a given. Okay. That she needs foreplay. Um, and he, giving him a gift of oral sex every now, of course that's fine every now and then. But we do get a lot of a lot of questions from women who say my husband will only want that, and that does seem wrong. Yeah, because... and now I will say if this husband is struggling with premature ejaculation, maybe he's not meaning that the oral sex is the foreplay mm -hmm. because he's saying that sex is oral sex. So he might yes. honestly be saying that like, hey, like I only last for two minutes. So why is sex 15 minutes for you and two minutes for me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so it might honestly be that because there are other issues, like maybe he just wants to touch more. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wants to make out more. Like that, mm -hmm. there might honestly be that as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that if your husband is saying, hey, like I know like the, the seven to ten Ten minutes that the actual sex is happening is great for me too but like you got a 35 minute back rub right right like that mm -hmm. I think that's also valid like mm -hmm. men can say like you know hey like we do spend a lot of time on you and like yes it is required for her to get yeah. to orgasm and so it's, it's not negotiable yeah. but that doesn't mean that he can't then ask for something either right but if he's getting to the point where he prefers a sex encounter where he doesn't have to concentrate on her. Yeah. And he's just getting served. That becomes a problem in the marriage. Exactly. And that's where I would say, keep working on intercourse. You can get there. <laughs> you can learn to make it last longer. Um, nothing wrong with giving gifts, but when your sexual experience is is almost entirely separate, taking turns, taking yeah. turns that, does, that does develop a dynamic that isn't necessarily great in the long run. Now, for some people, again, this is necessary because of disability or health but reasons. Also, but also, you, yeah. you can have sexual experiences that don't require penetrative sex that are done, like, you can, you can do things simultaneously yes. so that you're yes. sharing the experience still. Mm -hmm. What it sounds like she's saying from her comment is he yeah. will, you know, just all he wants is for him to get oral sex, mm -hmm. for him to get whatever foreplay means to him, and then for him to get oral sex. And right. then he'll take her, and then he'll do her. Yeah. And and those are not concurrent experiences, and yeah. that's the problem here, to yeah. be clear. Because we do need we do need some of those. And you know what? Quickies are great. Every now and then, giving your spouse a gift of a quickie is a wonderful thing. I think that's actually one of the days in 31 Days to Great Sex. But for pity's sake, that shouldn't be the sum total of your sexual relationship and I think mutuality is necessary so I think that this woman does have a point. All right, next one. Would you like to read this one? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so here's our next question. I've been going to pelvic floor physiotherapy after giving birth to my second child. I have had trouble having an orgasm and I have sensation issues. When we are having intercourse, I can't feel my husband very well and my orgasms are overall weaker and harder to attain. My PT recommended a vibrator to increase blood flow to the pelvis and to increase sensation. She said it's no different than a vibrating back massager or a vibrator used for other body muscles. It improves sensation and blood flow. My stand on vibrators has always been no because I don't want to depend on them to have an orgasm and I want my pleasure to come from my husband, not a machine. He would be mm -hmm. all for getting one if I need to, but I just don't know in this situation. I want to have great orgasms and a pleasurable sex life would it be wrong to get a vibrator for this situation first of all can we just do a shout out for pelvic floor physiotherapists yes if you're having <laughs> problems with anything related to the pelvic floor or sexual health um please see a pelvic floor pt yes they know so much and this is a relatively new thing i know when when i was first married in 1991 and i had vaginismus pelvic floor physiotherapists weren't even around. They they basically told me it was all in my head. Yeah. And that was so psychologically damaging. So the fact that we have uh, professionals who can actually deal with this stuff is amazing. And th what she's going through is quite common, yeah. where after the birth of a first or second or third or whatever child, um, your muscles have just been so worked over. I don't know what the <laughs> word is, but 
they've they, they've lost a lot of elasticity. Yeah, or if you've had a tear, you have scar tissue, and no yes. scar tissue doesn't have nerve endings. Right, and and so uh, and, and so going to a pelvic floor physiotherapist, you can learn exercises and get different therapies that can help you. Uh, and, and, you know, with scar tissue, you often have to learn how to loosen again mm -hmm. because scar tissue is very rigid, whereas the uh, vagina is usually quite elastic. But sometimes the problem is it's so elastic. It's like a stretched out elastic that's lost, yeah. that, that, you know, you pull it, but then it doesn't bounce back. Yeah. <laughs> and that sounds more like what she's going through is, you know, you pull it and then there's just nothing there. <laughs> and, so, and so if you get the blood flowing back to the area, you'll have better control. You can mm -hmm. tighten everything back up again. It might naturally tighten a little bit more on its own if the blood's actually pumping through. Yeah. So that's what they're trying to get happen here. And I would say, you know, if your pelvic floor physiotherapist thinks this is going to work for you, I don't think that's a problem. Yeah, now if your pelvic floor physiotherapist was saying something, because, you know, there's always good and there's bad in every profession. Like, yeah. if your PT was saying, like, well, if you just can't orgasm through sex, try a vibrator. Yeah. That's very different. But what yeah. she's saying here is you have, your body needs to relearn to mm -hmm. send blood to the fun bits. Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> what she's saying, right? right? Like, the pelvic floor physiotherapist is saying, use a vibrator to tell your body, we want the blood to go here. <laughs> yeah. Please send blood downstream. Yeah. Like, right. yeah. That's yeah. what we're trying to say here, right? And so if you were concerned about using a vibrator to require that for orgasm, mm -hmm. like you could try all sorts of things, right? Like you could use the vibrator until you become aroused and then allow, you know, mm -hmm. your husband to actually get you there, you know, mm -hmm. or... You can also have him use the vibrator so he's part of it. It's, it doesn't like it has like, to be a solo experience yeah, This either. is not the same thing as using a vibrator as a sex toy. No. This is using a vibrator as a medical device so that mm -hmm. you can then enjoy sex. There's something yeah. very... There's, there's a... It's a... It's a major difference there, actually, mm -hmm. and yeah, if you're if you're concerned about not being able to orgasm without it, then you know just just see like amp your way up. If you're gonna need this, and your physiotherapist says yeah. you need this, start with just being like, I'm just gonna use it until I'm able to even contract the muscles properly. Yeah, you know, yeah. or I'm just gonna use it until I start feeling like the buzz of arousal, right? Yeah. Or I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna use it until X Y Z, and then. You know, yeah. if that doesn't really work, then you just go a little bit mm -hmm. more as mm -hmm. as far as you're comfortable, right? Yeah. And this is, I'm, I'm, I hope the pelvic floor physiotherapist also has a lot of exercises that she's recommending yeah. at the same time, especially when the issue is that you're too loose after childbirth. There are quite a few exercises that you can be doing. Um, Kegel exercises, lots of things. And so um, do look into that. And if this is something that you're experiencing as well, where you've had some kids and now you've lost sensation, just know that this is something which is fixable. Yeah, and also, like, you can talk to your PT about this, too. Like, you can say, I'm just concerned because I don't want to be reliant on a, on a vibrator to orgasm. And they mm -hmm. should have literature yeah. to recommend to you. Mm -hmm. They should be able to address this. Yeah. And say, yeah. okay, if you're concerned about that, here are the steps you should take. Yeah. Okay, I got to tell the story. So, we were talking about... Um, uh, uh, medical aid device, I guess we could call it in on Facebook uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I mean, this thing, it, it's, a, it's a pelvic floor exerciser where you squeeze and it's an internal exerciser. You squeeze and it registers how hard you're squeezing. And it just helps train those muscles. Um, talk to, again, talk to a medical professional before you even think of, of using something like that because it's counterindicated for some issues, but it can really help in others. Anyway, so we were talking about this on Facebook and this one woman insisted that this was a sex toy. <laughs> and I mean, you should see this thing. It's like, it's like, oh, <laughs> it's the least sexy thing you can imagine, you know? <laughs> like, like, it works. Like, and again, lots of people were saying that that they used it and they loved it and it worked for them, but it's it's not like you're gonna you're gonna use it and be like, oh yeah, mama. Like it's, <laughs> it's not gonna be like that. You yeah. know, it is. It's it's a bumpy little. It's it's a it's just a. It's a medical device for Pete's sake. Yeah, and so and this it, poor woman is is yeah. going off in the comments. And that's and that's a, that's what we need to understand. Is your vagina? is part of your body. Yes. And sometimes we think that everything to do with the vagina needs to be sexual. Yeah. You know, which is why we don't talk about our feminine problems with, yeah. you know, with people. We can tell someone, hey, I sprained my thumb, but you can't say, my baby broke my vagina. Yeah. Out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, 
but your vagina is just a part of your body and there's a lot of muscles there and there's a lot of nerves and there's there's just a lot of stuff that but not, needs to work but and not only that your your pelvic floor health and like you know vaginal health also and it, it affects more than just your sex life yeah that's the thing is your your yeah. it's about whether or not you pee when you sneeze i'm sure yes. that has absolutely nothing to do with sex no. like there are even some studies that my pelvic floor physiotherapist showed me where your pelvic um, floor muscles can also impact your hips and your mm -hmm. uh, knee, even your knee joints through your posture and it now can, I'm trying to yeah, get that up straight. exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah as I yeah. said here slouch with my leg over my uh, yeah. my uh, leg over my knee um, no but these things are not only affecting us in our mm -hmm. in 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 sexual life ways like yes. in our, yeah. it doesn't only affect your sexuality it affects it's a very holistic area of your health is your pelvic mm -hmm. floor muscles for your pelvic floor muscles and so when we think of anything that goes into the vagina or has anything to do with the vagina um, as something that is inherently going to be sexual and therefore mm -hmm. needs to be done within the proper context make sure we're not sinning mm -hmm. like vaginal health mm -hmm. can be something that is sinful to aim for right and uh that that can be a problem like that poor woman who was on facebook and just kept on saying it's a sex toy <laughs> it goes in the vagina there are games attached it's therefore a sex toy <laughs> and everyone in the comments was like it's not a sex toy <laughs> a sex toy is not just anything to do with your vagina yeah <laughs> um we we yeah. tried and the poor poor lady yeah um but this is the thing, is using a vibrator may seem really, really um, mm -hmm. sinful. And we do want to be clear here, like, we're not saying you have to do anything that you personally are not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's not our point at all. Like, don't force yourself to do something you, first, you feel convicted about or that you feel is wrong for you. That's fine. But what mm -hmm. we're saying is that if you want, if you think this might help and you're kind of just hoping, but you're thinking, well, is this wrong or mm -hmm. can I try without guilt? Like, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a medical device, even if it's a medical device that may be used for sexual purposes and yeah. is being used so that sex feels better, that's not the same thing as getting a vibrator so that you, ha you don't have yeah. to figure out the orgasm piece without it. Yeah, and I do have a post uh, uh, where I say, can we have an awkward conversation about vibrators? Yeah. <laughs> where, where I do go into a lot of the concerns that, that I do have because I think that when we rely too much on vibrators, we can short circuit the arousal process mm -hmm. and, and women sometimes don't know how to learn to listen to their bodies because we do need to learn to listen. But it doesn't sound like that's her issue. And it sounds like she could orgasm until this second child. And so she does know how to listen to her body. It's just that her muscles aren't working and her blood flow is not working and all kinds of stuff isn't working. So get that working again and she's probably going to be okay. So remember that sometimes your vagina is just a vagina. A vagina. Yeah. And that's it. Okay. How many times can we say vagina? Let's try something else. <laughs> Here's our last question. I don't think you want to be here for this one because this one's awkward. Okay. Like will... the other ones aren't awkward. I don't know Let's if this honestly for it. is any awkward. Let's just go for it. Okay. Here we are. Awkward sex questions you can't ask your pastor. Podcast. My husband recently told me he really enjoys when I moan or make noises and he would love it if I did it more often. I usually only moan during orgasm, which has to be done orally. I am a very shy gal and feel so self-conscious about how I sound or what to say. I enjoy sex most of the time, just have never been a loud person. You're regretting sitting there now, aren't you? <laughs> You know what? A lot of husbands really do enjoy it because it just gives them feedback. Like, yep. guys just need feedback. And if we want guys to learn how to make us feel good, we need to tell them when they are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be, uh, this might be a little, okay, just when you're having sex with your husband, women have a very easy way to figure out if what they're doing is good. <laughs> like, it's either gonna stay up, <laughs> yep. or it's gonna go down. Yeah. Like, and for the most part, if you start doing something that's gonna feel real bad, it starts to go down. Yep. Um, men don't have as easy of a way to tell how yeah. their wives are, you know, doing, and how it's feeling, and, you know, 
although a lot of a lot it is good to work on communication mm -hmm. it also doesn't necessarily feel as nice as a husband if it's like mm -hmm. a constant barrage of that's good that's good that's good oh you're off the mark oh that's good so so <laughs> the whole, like being vocal during sex like that's yeah. just a really good way for your husband to know oh she likes this because she's making that sound yeah, yeah. and right? so you know moaning is great even saying even saying yeah that's great or exactly. that's nice or keep yeah. going or don't stop it doesn't have to be something like please apply 30 percent more pressure on a yeah, quarter inch but it left. also doesn't have to be oh take me you stallion like it doesn't, yes. <laughs> it doesn't need to be like like something you don't need to be waxing poetic about his love making prowess yeah and you certainly way. don't need to use any x-rated words no you know you don't need to do any of that it doesn't but... mean you have to become someone you're not yeah but here's here's another thing you know she says that she's really shy and she doesn't want to be loud but you know this may be a way to op to, to become more confident sexually mm -hmm. and to get more in touch with your sexuality too, because women, we were, we were created, we are created to have a wonderful time in the bedroom. And if you're, if you're just feeling some, somehow awkward, like if she's not able to vocalize, that could be because she also feels like this is somehow not proper. Like there's, there's Shelly, her name's not Shelly. I actually have no clue what her name was, but anyway, yes. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, there's the Shelly that everybody sees. And then there's, the Shelly in bed and they're two very different people mm -hmm. and so she feels like this is the real me and this is just me and I'm not quite sure what to do with her yeah <laughs> and we kind of need to integrate them and realize no you're still you and this is not a bad part of you this is not some part that you have to hide like it's like it's a secret what it is is it's a private side of you and yes. there's a difference between it being a secret part of you and a private part of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, know? the private part means, you know, we're going to take measures so that our neighbors aren't hearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But secret usually involves some sort of shame, and there shouldn't yes. be any shame here. And so the more that you're able to just be free with your husband, the better. And sometimes it just takes, like, you know, taking a deep breath and letting yourself say what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and that can really be such a confidence booster for him, too. It really, really can. Mm -hmm. The thing is, what what this husband sounds like he really wants to do is he just wants to make sure he knows that his wife is enjoying things. Yeah. yeah. You know? They figured out how to get her to orgasm because it sounds like she can only orgasm one way. Yeah. And it sounds like they do that because yeah. that's what she's yeah. she's saying they do. And so that's mm -hmm. great. You know? They're working together. And what he's asking for is like, I just, it would be nice to know when you're liking it. Yeah. Instead of only being told afterwards, yeah, that was good. Yeah. You know? It's like, it would be nice yeah. to know in the moment. Mm -hmm. you know and so that's that's just a great way to help so there we go another edition of sex questions you can't ask your pastor from the to love honor and vacuum podcast now before we i just kind of wanted to say something about the bad side of this before we oh we, okay yeah. before we ended up so the thing though when you do hear about um you know if a husband's asking his wife to moan more or make more noise like oh why don't you ever you know make those sexy noises in bed <laughs> sometimes the answer is because there's no reason to be moaning. Well, that's true, too. Okay? Yes. So if the problem is that he's like, I want you to act like you're liking sex, even mm -hmm. if you're not, mm -hmm. um, the response is kind of, well, let's, <laughs> maybe you should give me something to moan about. Yeah. Let's work on in that our, together. In our focus groups for a book, The Great Sex Rescue, which is out next spring, mm -hmm. um, we talked to one woman who, who uh, learned that her husband got really turned on when she moaned, yeah. And so she started moaning in order to please him, but there was nothing going on down there. Yeah, she was just, in essence, she was just faking it, right? Yeah. Because she was trying to give him what he wanted. Mm -hmm. And so you don't need to do that, okay? No, that's like, not what we're talking about. We're saying just don't be afraid to let it go when it naturally is starting mm -hmm. to happen. That's what we're saying. The other side of it as well, which is a mm -hmm. little bit worse, and again, if you're the person who read the who sent in the question who's listening to this, this does not sound like what you're talking about, okay? Yeah. But in some marriages, there is a pornography issue, or mm -hmm. there is a, some other sex addiction issue, or there's comparison to past girlfriends. Yeah. And if your husband or mm -hmm. your wife is asking you to perform a way in bed where you're acting out someone else's mm -hmm. fantasy yeah. um, in an unhealthy way, like, oh, why don't you moan like the porn stars do kind of thing, like... Uh, that's icky. That's not okay. And, yeah. I just wanted to put those two important caveats in there where, you know, sometimes there's nothing to moan about and the answer is not to just moan anyway, you know? Yes. And also you're never, you never need to act out someone else's fantasy mm -hmm. um, that requires you to be someone other than who you are. So, but when these kinds of things are coming up, just, you don't need to stifle them. You can, mm -hmm. you can just embrace it. You can be a little silly. You can be embarrassing and mm -hmm. that's okay. And that doesn't mean like, and that can actually be really sexy. Mm -hmm. um, for your spouse as well. And if that's a road that you want to 
go down if you want to figure all of this out. Please take a look at 31 Days to Great Sex. We've mm -hmm. got uh, some great exercises in there on how to make sure that she is moaning, how to, yes. how to make sure that she feels good, how to spice things up. Also some great um, exercises that can help her relax more and embrace her sexuality and her confidence. Um, and so take a look at that book. It launches July 14th. You can get it. You can pre-order it now. Uh, and there are links in the podcast description and the podcast post that goes along with this podcast. And remember, this is your last chance. Yes. Get in on the webinar. Tonight, July 9th. <laughs> I will not be answering questions. No, These just are, me. <laughs> yes. So you may get some that are definitely not appropriate to doing as a mother-daughter pair. Oh, I'm not really sure. I'm not really bar. sure what we should get at this point. Oh my goodness. Yeah. No, but this is the last chance. It's starting mm -hmm. tonight at nine o'clock. And so you have to get your, uh, your seat before then. So yeah. $20 gets you the 31 Days to Great Sex, the 24 Sexy Dares. Um, entrance to the webinar, your chance to ask a question, which hopefully I will get to as many as I can, and then I will be publishing uh, just a little ebook that goes into all of the questions that I couldn't get to as well. Um, so take a look at that in the podcast description. And thank you for joining us on the To Love, Honor, and Vacuum podcast, both on YouTube and uh, Spotify, iTunes, wherever you like wherever to listen to you your listen. podcast. Yes. And we will see you next week for another edition of the To Love, Honor, and Vacuum podcast and even more sex questions you can't ask your pastor. Or shouldn't. Yes. <laughs>